on uh, the power of giving, and uh, you see the hands reaching out there, um, and uh, we're going to go into this um, uh, next message in the, in the series called Intentionally Make a Difference. Everybody say intentionally. intentionally. Everybody say intentionally. intentionally. Everybody say intentionally. Intentionally. intentionally make, that's a key word for today. Intentionally make a difference. We have a, a four-step process of who we are here and uh, know God and find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. So we're in a series now that lends to making a difference. And so I want to read 1 Timothy 6, 18 through 19. It'll be on the screens behind me. Tell them to use their money to do what? Watch this. They should be rich in what? So the Bible says we should be rich in good works and generous to those in need. If you want to know what the will of God is for your life, that's part of it right there. Be rich in good works, generous to those in need. Always be ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience, what's the next two words say? True life is tied to intentionally giving and serving. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word through song. God, great are you, Lord. God, we thank you. We intentionally want to make a difference in the lives of others. What a joy it is to be here today and to worship you. And now for the next few moments, I ask you to arrest our attention. I ask, Father, you anoint me to preach your word, not in tongue, word and tongue only, but also in power and in deed. Let this seed fall in the good soil of our hearts and grow and bear forth fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Hold your Bibles up in whatever form you have, and let's boldly declare, Father, Father today, today. This, week, this week, by your grace, I'm going to be a doer of your word and not a hearer only, deceiving my own self. Now, Lord, anoint my ears, anoint my heart, anoint my spirit, my soul, my mind, and my body to receive the truth of your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. High five somebody near you and say intentionally make a difference. Intentionally simply means in an intentional manner, with awareness of what one is doing purposely. You're doing something on purpose. Intentional is to purposely try to accomplish something. Now, when concerning the kingdom of God and the Bible, we have to be intentional or purpose-driven to make a difference in the lives of others. Live every day with eternity in mind. Let me say that again. Live every day with eternity in mind. Matthew 6, 19 through 20. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. So how do I live my life like this? How do I live my life with eternity in mind? Well... You got to be intentional. Everybody shout out, be intentional. be intentional. Live your life. I've got to live my life to help people. That's why we're left on this earth. Find someone sad and smile at them. Find someone down and encourage them. Find someone hopeless and inspire them. Bless those around you. Live to serve, like Rebecca, if you missed last week, go back online and listen to the message. Serve, like she... <laughs> Live to give. It was a very long day on Capitol Hill, and Senator Stennis just wanted to go home and rest a while. It was an exhausting season. It was an exhausting day. He parked the car, he walked to the front doors, and two men jumped out of the bushes near his front door, robbed him and shot him and left him for dead. Well, it, the, the shooting of Senator Stennis was uh, shocking to Washington and the nation. They left him for dead. He was the chairman of the powerful Armed Forces Committee. For seven hours, he laid on an operating table at Walter Reed Hospital fighting for his life. 
Another politician left Capitol Hill that same day, even stayed longer, was wore out, exhausted, on the way home, heard on the radio, Senator Stennis had been shot and taken to Walter Reed Hospital, to which he promptly turned the car around and drove straight to the hospital. As he got into the hospital, he could see how swamped the hospital staff was, and they weren't able to field phone calls. They were getting inundated with phone calls to try to check on Senator Stennis' condition. So he saw an unmanned switchboard. He walked over, sat down, voluntarily picked up the phones and started working. He worked literally all night until daylight. Somewhere that morning he got up, he stretched, he put on his overcoat, he told the person next to him on the other switchboard, hey, I'm Mark Hatfield, happy to help out. He walked out the door without any fanfare, without any pomp or circumstance, and the the press could hardly take it. They didn't know what to do to have Senator Mark Hatfield to show up on the other side of the coin, on the other side of the political balance. They didn't know how to take a conservative Republican, let alone not even give a tip of the hat to a liberal Democrat, but to sit for hours all night and do a menial task like pick up the phone and answer phone calls in his behalf just to be happy to help out. That senator, what he did was intentional. He intentionally gave himself. He intentionally gave what he had. He intentionally gave his abilities. He lowered himself. He took no fanfare, and he said, I'm just going to serve. And that leads me to point number one, and that is this, intentionally give. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, intentionally give. Give whatever you have. Listen, you and I are responsible for what we have, not what we don't have. You'll never be held accountable for what you don't have, but you will be held accountable for what you did with what you had. 2 Corinthians 9, 11 says this. You will be enriched in every way so that, watch this. God says, I want to bless you in every way so that you can be generous on what? Every occasion, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Here's the deal. Here's what I've learned about God. God will enable you with something that you have more than most have. He'll enable you with something more than most have. You say, Pastor, I don't have much to give monetarily. I don't have a whole lot. Did you know I just read recently, the latest statistic is, if you bring in more than $36,000 a year to your, your household, you live, watch this, in the top 1% of the world. You are in the top 1% of the world's income, and you are, you are 99% richer and wealthier than the rest of the world if you just make $36,000 a year or more. We are wealthy people in America. Holly and I have a plan to give with eternal purposes. Never give without an eternal purpose in mind. Obviously, the tide goes to the church, but what we give over and above that goes for the gospel. It goes so that people's lives will be changed. It goes so people will be transformed. It goes so people will be saved to missions, to missionaries, to different orphanages. Have a plan. Have a plan to give and serve. Let me ask you this. Do you have a plan to give? Pastor, I've never really thought about it. Well, hey, maybe you start with tithing. Maybe you're not a tither. You say, well, i got to start somewhere. Start with tithing. Maybe you're a tither, and you say, I, I give tithes, but I don't give offerings above that. Okay, well, maybe just stretch it out a little bit. Give to some different ministries in the church. Buy a turkey for somebody in need. Give to a missions field somewhere. Start giving a little bit over and above where you're at right now. Maybe if you're in the habit of tithing and offerings, maybe you decide to expand on that a little bit. What is your plan to serve? What is your plan to serve for the kingdom of God? Because if you just show up every Sunday and never do anything for God, you're never going to do anything for God. You've got to put a plan in place. 
If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Let me say it again. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So what is your, you say, well, pastor, I don't even serve anywhere. I'm new to church. Okay, come to Connecting Point. Maybe your first step is come to Connecting Point. Maybe it's, hey, I want to learn about the church. I want to learn about my gifts. I want to learn about my personality, how I fit in and where I can plug in. Maybe you've been to Connecting Point. Maybe it's time for you to say, you know what? I'm going to plan to serve once a month somewhere. I'm going to give what I can. I'm going to give my life, my talents, my abilities, and serve the kingdom of God somewhere. Maybe you're doing once a month. You want to expand on that. Then you, then you volunteer in different places. But if you don't plan, you're never going to make anything happen. And so let me tell you about money real quick. There are five things you can do with money. Everybody say five things. Five. Number one, you can spend it. That's me first. You can repay debt. That's creditor second. You can pay taxes. That's government third. You can save it. That's me fourth. Notice there's a lot of me on that list. Five, you can give it. That's others last. Did you know that's the way the world does things? I'm here to tell you that God has called us to live in a different way. God has called us to flip that around a little bit. Amen? Second, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says this. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. In other words, you should be funding the church and the ministries of the church every single week so that, hey, the church can reach out to people in need. So what's one intentional way you can do this? You should have received three of these cards when you came in the door. I hope that you did. If not, we'll give them to you on the outside as you walk out. Jesus loves you. Everybody say, Jesus loves you. I mean, it's a great thing to hand somebody. Here's the plan. On the back of this, you can check us out. There are three ways. You can go to thebridgecency.com. They can go on our Facebook. They can do our social media. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We gave you three because between now and December 25th, I would love for you to take a five, three, actually five mile radius of this church and intentionally bless somebody and hand them one of these cards. Maybe you go out to eat, you and your spouse, and it's a $30 bill. Why not double it and give them a $30 tip with a Jesus loves you card? How many know that'll get their attention? How many, how many know, you know, stick a $50 bill in your wallet? I know it may be a huge stretch for some. Listen, take this out and bless somebody with a $50 bill. Go through the drive through at, at a coffee shop and buy the person's coffee behind them and leave this with the person to hand to them. Do something intentionally to bless somebody within about a five-mile radius of this place and hand them one of these. They can check out our church information, but this is a plan. This is a plan to get you started to bless somebody. Who knows? It might open a conversation about Jesus, and you might be able to lead them to the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. You got from November the 12th to December 25th to just three times bless somebody. Is that all right? Yeah. Can I get a good amen? Amen. Yeah. That's an easy way to reach out right here in your own time, in your own way, in our own neighborhood. Secondly, we need to intentionally serve. Everybody say intentionally serve. This is where I'm going to park the bulk of this message. 1 Timothy 6, 18 through 19. We read the scripture. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and be generous to those in need. Okay, so pastor, how do I get started? Well, sign up to be on the dream team. Pump your neighbor say, what's the dream team? The dream team is anybody who serves in any capacity in this church for the glory of God. We get it. We borrowed it from the dream team back in the early 90s, basketball team. America started going to the Olympics. And remember the first one? Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan. They obliterated everybody. I mean, they just, just killed teams, 60, 70-point victories. They were called the dream team. They were like the all-star team against the world. They just destroyed everybody. Listen, we are the dream team for God. If you do anything, drive a bus, pray during the week, do anything, send out cards, greet, sing, whatever you do for the Lord that is attached to this church, you are on the dream team. So again, get a plan for serving. Maybe you go to Connecting Point. We'll roll it out next month. Maybe you show up, you attend, you learn about yourself. Then get on the dream team somewhere. Sign up. Serve. Poke your neighbor. Say you're a 10 at something. Now poke it again. Poke them again and say it like you mean it. You're a 10 at something. 
Do you know what that means from a scale to 1 to 10, a 10 being the best? You are the best at something. Everybody is. Carol has a million-dollar smile at that front door. Pastor, she said, I can't stand there long. I said, well, sit down in the chair and just give them that beautiful smile you got. How many loves to see a smile when you come in the doors? Amen? <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. Look, it's not about the church needing you. It's about you needing to serve. I'm going to say it again. It's not about the church needing you. It's about you needing to serve. Serving helps discover your purpose. Listen to this statement. The day you discover what your purpose is, is the day fulfillment is going to happen in your life. The day you discover what your purpose is, why you're on this earth, is the day fulfillment is going to happen in your life. Focus is going to happen. The ultimate purpose of my life, watch this now, the ultimate purpose in your life is to make a difference. You say, Pastor, no, it ain't. It's to worship God and live for God. Okay, listen, God can do that with us in heaven. The reason you are left here to breathe another day on this earth is because your ultimate goal is not to pay bills. It is not to make money. It is not to acquire possessions. It is not to retire at the age of 48. It is to make an eternal difference in someone's life. Glory to God. Intentionally make a difference. The gravitational pull for all people, myself included, is selfishness. We have to intentionally serve and intentionally give. Serving in your purpose, watch this, takes you from survival mode to significance mode. It takes you from just trying to get through the day, get, thank God it's Friday, I made the weekend, glory to God. It gets you from that to like every day my life matters. I make a difference, whether it's on the job or wherever it is. Quit looking at your job. If I could just get through the day, it's hump day. It's Thursday. Woo, it's Friday. I get the weekend off. Why don't we go to work and say, this is my mission field. I'm going to make a difference today. What is your life about? What is your purpose? Listen, what people say at your funeral is what your life is really about. What they're going to say about Mildred Daniel tomorrow is what her life was really about. When you are long gone and pushing up daisies and they're eating potato salad after your funeral, guess what? That is what they say about you then is what your life was about. So here's the thing I'm going to say. Why not let them talk about how you fulfilled your purpose for the kingdom of God and you made a difference in the lives of others? Psalm 112, 5 through 6 says, Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. Let me ask you something. What does God think about what you're doing with your life? What, what does God think about how you're giving and serving? Are you intentionally serving? Are you fulfilling your purpose? What, what, what could happen to those around you if you intentionally served? What, what lives could be changed if you fulfilled your purpose? Victor Frankl, you may remember the book, The Meaning of Life. If you've never read it, I encourage you to read it. He was a Holocaust survivor, a Jewish man from Vienna, Austria. He was writing his book. The Nazis came, they took his work, they threw it and burned it in the fire, and they killed his entire family. He was the only person in his entire family to survive the Holocaust. When the war was over, he went back to Vienna, Austria to resume his practice as a psychiatrist. He was given the incredibly difficult task that every client he had was a Holocaust survivor that all wanted to commit suicide. At the end of his days, at the end of his career, not one of his patients ever under his care committed suicide. He, had, he was in, in stark disagreement and contrast with Sigmund Freud's theory that life is all about pleasure. Sigmund Freud, who's psychologist shoved down our throats, tells you that, hey, if you get enough pleasures in life, then you'll actually enjoy life. Well, Viktor Frankl went head to head with him and he said, no, you've got it wrong. Life is not about pleasure. Life is about purpose. I'm going to say it again. Life is about purpose. 
And here's what he said. He said, Mr. Freud, if you don't have purpose in your life, watch this, then you're going to dull your life with pleasures. Are you trying to satisfy something that has always been missing on the inside of you with something on the outside? Look, vacations are great, hobbies, sports, shopping, acquiring possessions, all these things are great. But listen, none of them are ultimately going to make you happy because they're not designed to. The only thing, watch this, is really going to give you fulfillment in life is living for Jesus and walking out your purpose in life. Ask yourself, listen, one of the greatest assignments I do in leadership training, which I may do next year, listen, one of the greatest things I do is I challenge people, and it freaks people out. I want you in one sentence to write, what is your purpose in life? People can't do it. They say, well, I'm supposed to love my wife. I say, well, every husband is. That's not your individual purpose. Well, it's got to be on there. No, it doesn't. That's a given. What is your, why are you on planet Earth? What is your purpose? And are you fulfilling it? Viktor Frankl called something, he created something called logotherapy. Everybody say logotherapy. logotherapy. Listen, it's all rooted in the Bible. It's thousands of years old, but so he didn't really create it. He just got it from the Bible. But he came up, it, it involved three things. He said, let me help the world with how to walk and live in their purpose and be fulfilled in their life. He said, number one, everyone needs some type of meaningful work. Let me say it again. Everybody needs some type of meaningful work, right? We all work, but how much of us are working meaningful? Are we walking in our purpose? He said, secondly, everybody needs a community of friends to work with. And then he said, thirdly, everyone needs to learn how to take their pain and use it to help someone else, i.e. make a difference. Some of the greatest ministries are birthed out of the greatest pain in people's lives. They go through a tragedy, they decide to use it for the glory of God, and they use it to build other people up. I've got a question for you. Are you walking in meaningful days in your life? Every day you should get up and say, I've got meaning today. I've got purpose today. I'm going to make a difference today. If all I do is smile at people, I'm going to hopefully put a smile on their face. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Hebrews 6.10 says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him. Leave this up for a second. As you have helped his people and continue to help them. Watch this now. The word as means it's a conjunction. So what he's saying after the word as joins to what was said before that. So God says, you show me love. How many would like to know how you can show God love tangibly? He says, you show God love. You show God the love you have for him as you help his people. Does your life show that you love God by how you help people? Let me flip that around. What is your life showing and how you love or maybe not love so much God? See, there's more to life than this life. James 4, 14 says, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. The world is constantly pulling us into this life. But I want to tell you there's another life after this life. You've heard the acronym YOLO. Everybody say YOLO. YOLO. You say, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, you have. You only live once. That's usually an acronym to just help terrible behaviors to be acceptable. You only live once. You only live once. You only live once. Listen, that's horrible advice because it's horribly biblically untrue. The fact is we need in church and world to adopt a different one called YOLT. Everybody say YOLT. Uh, The fact is we only live twice. You don't only live once, you live twice. Hebrews 9, 27, and just as it is appointed for man to die once after that comes the judgment. Watch this. You get a two-question test when you leave this earth. How many know and want to know what those questions are? We're going to go through a review. How many like teachers that would give you a review before the test? 
Here we go. God sent me today to give you review, right? Poke your neighbor, say, tune in, it's review time. Here's two questions, and this is the most important question you will ever be asked in your life at any point in your life. When you stand before God, God is going, you'll see it on the screen, He's going to ask you, what did you do with my son, Jesus? Revelation 20, 11 through 12 says this, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Now watch this. People who do not accept Jesus Christ, do not live for him, you get judged based on what you have done. Now I don't know about you, but that's already making me a little bit scary because I know some things I've done. People that are in the church that are quote unquote saved, that have given their life to Jesus, you don't get judged based on what you did. You get judged based on whether your name is written in the book of life. Now, I don't know. I like you like, like a box of chocolates, Forrest Gump said. And I don't know. I'm not a very smart man. But I don't think I would like to be judged by what I've done. I'd much rather be judged by my name being in the book. So how do you get your name in the book of life? You're here and you say, I think I want my name in the book. How do I get my name in the book? You ready? A real relationship with Jesus Christ. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we, did we pro not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons, in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Watch this. When God asks you, what did you do with my son Jesus? Here's your answer. I'm going to help you pass the test. You ready? Ready? I knew him personally. How many know him personally? It's the only question that ever matters in this life, ever. And it's the most important one because it changes eternal destinations. Now, if you pass that one, only for those that pass, for those that didn't know Jesus personally, it's straight to hell, it is straight to eternal damnation. But for those of us that know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, you then get question number two. Poke your neighbor and say question number two. Here we go. You ready for the review? Question number two is this. What did you do with what I gave you? Be a witness. I like that, Jim. What did you do with what I gave you? God's going to say, you know, I gave you time. Did you use it for my eternal purposes? I gave you talents. Did you use them for my glory? I, I, I gave you money and resources. Did you use them for kingdom purposes? I gave you arms. Did you hug people and help people? I gave you a face. Did you smile at people? I gave you a tongue. Did you use it to encourage people, build them up? God is going to ask for an account of what we have and what we did. Now, this question gets asked at the judgment seat of Christ. Listen, it's not a judge like the judge with a gavel in the courtroom, guilty. That's it. You're out. That's already been settled by your name being in the book of life through Jesus. The imagery here, judge, is not the courtroom judge. It is like an Olympic judge. What does the judge do in the Olympics, right? If you fail, if you don't get a 7.0 to the firing squad, you go. That's not what they do. They don't shoot them dead because they lost. They just don't get a reward because they weren't good enough. They didn't do enough to do to get the score. So what do they do? They say, well, that's an 8.3. Whoo, that was awesome. That's a 9.8. Eh, that stunk. That's 5.4. You're out. Right, gold medal, bronze medal, silver medal. It's not about whether you live or die in the Olympics. It's about rewards. That is what the judgment seat of Christ is. It is God scoring your life for rewards. So watch this. 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all, everybody say all, all, appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us, poke your neighbor, say, are you in each? You're in each. So each of us may receive, watch this, what is due for us, the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. 
Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in the Father's glory with angels. Watch this. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Reward means give away, give up, and, and to give back. In other words, he says, I'm going to pay you back. You're already saved if you're with Jesus. So the second question is, he's going to say, what did you do with what I have? Oh, I see that you did things for my eternal glory, and I'm going to bless you for every one of them and reward you. Revelation 22:12, 12, the last chapter in the Bible. Look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person. Poke your neighbor and say, are you in each? According to what they have done. Reward here means dues paid for work. Pay for service. Wages higher. It's like credit card points. If you use a credit card and you build points and then eventually you cash them in. You get a free flight or you whatever you want to cash them in for. You travel or whatever you want to do. You are using the credit card. Watch this. And they're rewarding you for using their card. Now if you're paying them 20 something percent interest. You're not being rewarded. You're paying dearly for that, but just so we know. But if you're getting rewards, you're there saying, we're going to reward you. And they're rewarding you because they know 88% of people carry interest. So they're, they're smart. They, they figured it out. But let's say you beat the system. You're getting rewarded because you use the card. Watch this. Everything you do for Jesus Christ and the kingdom and the glory of God, God says, oh, there's another reward. There's another point. Oh, I love that motive there. There's another one. And one day when you stand before God, he says, what did you do with what I gave you? Listen, the right answer is I used what you gave me to make an eternal difference. Intentionally make a difference. General William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, was losing his eyesight. And they, they grabbed his son, Bramwell, and they said, hey, you're going to be the one to tell him, oh, great. He said, Dad, he said, it looks like you're not going to recover your eyesight. He says, are you telling me I'm going blind? He says, ah, I'm afraid I'm telling you that. He said, well, he said, I have done what I, have, what I could for God and his people with my eyesight. Now I shall do what I can for God and his people without my eyes. Papa, my wife's grandfather, Brenda's dad, he used to tell me when he couldn't get out anymore, He'd say, I'd give anything if I could preach one more time. He said, but I'll tell you what I can do. I can pray. And pray he did. Seven to eight hundred names, organizations, every single day of his life, he prayed. We can do what we can. And thirdly, point number three, and finishing this up, intentionally share Christ. Poke your neighbor and say, intentionally share Christ. Matthew 5, 19 through 20 says, My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. People are the only thing we can take with us to heaven. I was watching AGT, America's Got Talent, and they brought on this comedian. They said, what do you do? He says, well, I'm a comedian. He sits at the keyboard, and he starts playing. And what he's going to do, he's going to do a funny song. He says, I'm going to play you a song. This is national TV, millions of people watching, millions, thousands in the audience. He says, I'm going to play a song. And he said, you know, I grew up in church. So he said, I'm going to play a song and how it would be sung in the predominantly white church, how white people do it. And then I'm going to play, he was, a, he was a black comedian. He said, I'm going to play it how we do it in the black church, what I grew up in. And it was really funny. I mean, and it was very true. If you heard the different, same song. But here was the brilliancy of it. I stopped it. I rewinded it again. I pointed out to my family, look at this, look at this. He went up there of anything he could have sang, anything he could have wanted to do. He chose to sing twice John 3.16. That man intentionally sang the gospel of Jesus Christ for millions on TV, for thousands in the audience. When he was done, he didn't get ridiculed for sharing the gospel. They stood to their feet in a roaring ovation, and you could hear over here one judge tell the other one, Well, I'd like to go with him to church. He intentionally went on there, and he sang the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Woo! I have a question for you today. What are you doing to intentionally share the gospel with other people? Here's what I've discovered. If we'll intentionally make a difference, I will never miss 
what I invest in eternity. Let me say it again. I will never miss what I invest in eternity. I'd like for you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want everybody to take this message home and ask yourself, what is my plan for giving? What is my plan for serving? But before we get into any of that, I'm not going to embarrass you, but if you're hearing the sound of my voice and you say, Pastor, if God asked me, what did I do with my son, Jesus Christ, his son, Jesus Christ, I, I don't have that answer. I, I, don't, I don't know Jesus. I've never surrendered to him. I don't have a real relationship with him. I don't want to be in that place where I have to say I don't know or I've rejected or I never really chose. By not choosing, you're actually choosing. You have to choose to accept and serve Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I'd be greatly amiss if I didn't give everyone the opportunity right here, right now. Should you take your last breath today and stand before God and he say to you, what did you do with my son Jesus? If you cannot say, I had a relationship with Jesus, I personally knew him, I accepted him, I accepted the forgiveness of my sins, I, the cross of Calvary, the blood of Jesus washed my sin away, I receive it joyfully and I choose to live for him now. If you cannot answer that question and you would like to, in just a moment I'm going to ask you at the count of three to raise your hand, nobody's going to embarrass you. But I want you to hold your hand up. Somebody's going to come by. There's a prayer team. They're going to be looking around, and they're going to come to you, and they're going to pray. And they're going to help you be able to answer that question, I knew him personally.